Mark Hacking and Lori Suarez attended Orem High School south of Salt Lake City, Utah. He was a senior, and she was a sophomore when they met on a trip to Lake Powell. During the friend group trip, Mark burned his hands in the bonfire. Typical of her kind-hearted nature, Lori helped him tend to the burns throughout the night. The high school sweethearts married in 1999. Described as affectionate and loving, by all accounts the couple fit together well. Thelma Suarez, Lori's mom, said in an interview with Oprah, he always treated her like she was something precious to him. He did special little things for her always. They adored each other. They were in love. Lori worked as an assistant stockbroker for Wells Fargo Security Services, serving as the main financial support while Mark was in school full-time at the University of Utah. It was a perfect give and take. She'd take care of them now, and hopefully they'd have a family that she could raise, and he would take care of the finances later. Mark and Lori were members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, often referred to as the LDS Church, and more often miscalled the Mormon Church. Five years into their marriage, Mark and Lori were on the verge of big changes. Mark had graduated from the University of Utah, with honors no less, and had been accepted to the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. He would be attending medical school. He was going to be a doctor, just like his father and his brother. In order to make the big move from Utah to North Carolina, Lori was fastidiously planning for the next phase of their lives. Their apartment was filled with moving boxes, and because sometimes life throws all of the things at us at once, Lori had just found out that she was pregnant. She was going to tell her mom the exciting news the following week, just before the couple was to make the transition to North Carolina. Lori and her brother had been adopted, and now Lori was about to start her own family. Such an exciting moment, but it was bittersweet. She would be essentially alone, while Mark would be extremely busy finishing school. The big picture was scary and exciting and hectic, Leaving her family and friends, vacating her job, a cross-country move, Mark attending medical school, and growing a human being. Lori gave notice to Wells Fargo that she would soon be leaving the company. Her co-workers threw her a going-away party with, We'll miss you, Lori, on her farewell cake. On Friday, the 16th of July, Lori received a call from, and had spoken with, someone from the University of North Carolina. She was seen crying after the call and left work clearly distressed. Her co-worker told KSL News, I said, hey Lori, what's up? And she said, nothing. And started walking away. And I said, are you sure? And she said, yeah. And then she got in her car and zoomed right past me, didn't even wave. Sunday, July 18th, Mark and Lori went to a housewarming party in Bountiful. Surveillance cameras showed the two of them stopping at a convenience store on the way home to buy some sodas. The clerk was familiar with Mark as he frequented the store, and he later reported that Mark seemed happy. Lori, however, did not. Monday, July 19, 2004. In the early morning of Monday, July 19, Mark called multiple people to report that his wife, Lori, hadn't come back from her morning jog. She frequented the same basic route through Salt Lake City's Memory Grove and City Creek Canyon. Though newly pregnant, it was completely normal and expected for her to jog each morning. Most of the time Mark went with her, but that morning he didn't. What if she'd fallen in a canyon and was injured? Or maybe she just went to work early? After all, these were to be her last days of work there. Mark made contact with Lori's supervisor at Wells Fargo but she was not there. The supervisor told him, Mark, you've got to call the police. Get off the phone right now and call the police. So, just before 10 a.m., like any good, worried husband would, Mark went to Bradley's Sleep Etc. to buy a new mattress and pillows. Then he called 911 at 10.49 a.m. to report Lori missing. Don't judge him, he had things to do. Lori's mom, Thelma, was the next call he made. I was at work and he called me on the phone. It was about 10.40 in the morning. He said, Thelma, and I could tell by the tone of his voice. I said, Mark, what's wrong? And he said, Thelma, Lori went jogging and she never came back. And I said, have you called the police? 
and he said he had, but they wouldn't do anything for 24 hours because she's an adult. So I asked him where he was, and he said he was just walking around. And I said, I'll be right there. But that 24-hour time frame wasn't really the case. The year before, Elizabeth Smart had been abducted from her home in Salt Lake City and had been held captive for nine months by a religious charlatan, Brian David Mitchell. The distance between the Smart's home and the hacking's apartment was only a six-minute drive. Then, exactly one month after Elizabeth was rescued, the body of Lacey Peterson was sadly discovered after she had been missing for four months. She had been about eight months pregnant when her life and the life of her baby Connor were tragically taken, and it was uncovered that her husband, Scott Peterson, had been leading a double life. Elizabeth Smart and Lacey Peterson were still fresh in everyone's mind, and no one wasted any time looking for Lori Hacking. Police arrived at Memory Grove to search for Lori, and Mark was already there to greet them. A massive search ensued, including the Hacking's home. That day that Lori disappeared, investigators removed a part of the bed from their apartment, but only the box spring, not the mattress. Many other items were confiscated. One item recovered via search warrant was an envelope with Mark's name written on it. Inside was a letter from Lori. I want to grow old with you, but I can't do it under these conditions. I hate coming home from work because it hurts to be home in our apartment. I can't imagine life with you if things don't change. I got someone I don't want to spend the rest of my life with unless changes are made. That letter was retrieved at the same time a bloody hunting knife and bloody bedding were taken. That night, a disturbance was reported to the police about a man acting strange. In the late hours of the 19th, or the early hours of the 20th, Mark Hacking was found running through the streets. He was wearing sandals. He was wearing only sandals. Bare-cheeked Mark was admitted into a psychiatric unit at the University of Utah Medical Center for evaluation. As the days progressed, over 1,200 volunteers scoured the area where Lori was known to jog. Police dogs were deployed, and helicopters searched from the sky to find her. Mark's brothers, Scott and Lance, visited him in the psychiatric ward at the hospital. Mark confessed to them that he had, in fact, murdered Lori. Scott said that, after the confession, My brother and I sat and hugged him for about an hour, and then we went home. Their father, Douglas, said, When it was all done, he said, I never felt as relieved or miserable at the same time. It's a terrible dilemma for him to be in. The police were informed of Mark's confession to his brothers. A candlelight vigil took place that night at the location where Lori's car had been discovered in Memory Grove Park. The driver's seat of her car was adjusted for a much larger person. Lori would not have been able to reach the pedals with its position. That day was supposed to have been when Lori would tell her mom about her pregnancy. Mark retained a defense attorney. The following day, the hacking's apartment was cleared out by police and family members. Almost everything was in boxes, preparing for the move that would not be happening. On the 28th, police said that it was possible that Lori never went jogging on the morning of the 19th. Mark had been in the hospital for mental evaluation for two weeks ever since he'd frolicked in his birthday suit and Crocs. I have no idea if he was wearing Crocs. Sources only say sandals. But in my mind, he's wearing Crocs that are a little too big and really loud and floppy with each step. Either that, or he's in Birkenstocks with a really intensely pale tan line from socks. Salt Lake City Police Chief Rick Dintz announced that Mark Hacking had been arrested upon his release from the hospital for the intentional death of his pregnant wife, Lori. Though her remains had not been found, the totality of circumstantial evidence painted a dire picture. Very quickly in the investigative process, 
shocking truths were revealed. Mark's life had been filled with deception. He had not been attending the University of Utah, and if he wasn't in school, he couldn't have graduated with honors, and if he didn't graduate with honors, then he wasn't accepted to medical school, and if he wasn't accepted to medical school, then there was no reason for Lori to quit her job and for the two of them to move to North Carolina. If they had no need to move to North Carolina, what was going to happen the following week when movers showed up to take their things? How was Mark planning to handle that? Beyond those complete fabrications, the big lies were built and propped up with tons of smaller lies. The lies to fill in the blanks, the daily lies, the lies to bolster lies and the lies just because. Despite Mark being an active member in the LDS church, he'd been living a private life of smoking and drinking things which are against LDS values. It's unclear when 28-year-old Mark began his secretive life, but it had been at least a decade. Prior to marriage, Mark and Lori dated until Mark decided to serve a two-year church mission in Winnipeg, Canada. At the time, it was standard for men to embark on their missions at 19 years old, though I'm not sure if that's when Mark went. If so, Lori would have been 17. Lori was going to wait for him to return, and then the two would marry. But one year into his two-year mission, Mark was sent home. In the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, it's quite uncommon for someone to be sent home from their mission, especially for the reason Mark was. He'd been caught having a relationship with a woman he'd been proselytizing. Missions for the Church strictly forbid any kind of dating. The whole point is to teach and provide service for those in need, not to hop into intimate situations. Mark had been a district leader in his area. One of the missionaries he served with later said that Mark had never mentioned having a girl back home waiting for him. He'd never heard of Lori. He further said, I was very surprised when he ended up being sent home, and when I found out later what had happened, that was what blew me away. I think he got a taste of freedom and did a little bit of lying with the girlfriend up there and maybe came home and had the pressure of going back and getting into his regular life. I think he had to make up some lies to tell his family as to why he came home early and lying became easier and easier to him because he was getting out of things. That guy nailed it. Lying became easier and easier to him. When Mark was unceremoniously sent home early, Lori was devastated by his cheating. Mark told her that his missionary companion had also done some bad things and was also sent home early. Not that it specifically matters here, but I did read that there were others engaging in the same types of shenanigans, with one scenario resulting in an oopsie pregnancy. I'm just not sold on the extent of that, or even whether anyone else was involved. Maybe. But if it came from Mark's mouth alone, it didn't happen. I'm more inclined to believe that he needed to toss others under the bus with him when he was caught with his, you know. When Mark and Lori's relationship had been repaired and they married, Mark continued a hidden life. He smoked, drank, partied, generally doing things that Lori never would have accepted. Upon hearing about the world of Mark's deception, Lori's mom, Thelma, visited him at the hospital prior to his release and arrest. In her interview with Oprah, she said, As I walked in, he was standing, and he put his arms out, and enfolded me in his arm. I just whispered into his ear, Mark, didn't you know that my love for you was not conditional upon you becoming a doctor? He didn't answer. Lori's father, Araldo, told Fox News that when the search for Lori was active, Mark said that he would never hurt Lori with the same face he used to tell me about school. Now I don't believe him. Remember that night before Lori was reported missing, Mark and Lori were seen at the convenience store buying sodas, and Mark looked happy, but Lori didn't? Only four hours later, Mark was seen alone on the same cameras. He was buying cigarettes and, more ominously, he was seen examining his hands. 
Mark's confession was that he shot Lori with a 22 caliber rifle while she slept. He said that he put her body, the weapon, and the bloody mattress in trash bins. The gun and the mattress were never found. Thelma said, He shot Lori while she was asleep and dumped her in the dumpster. I told him that I couldn't imagine why he started this intricate web of lying. We were all caught up in it. We were genuinely caught up in it. We lived it with him. We lived that lie. Even then, if you had told us, you know, explain something, we would have stood by you. We would have tried to help you, but instead, you chose to murder Lori and your own child. The search for Lori as a missing person shifted to searching the Salt Lake Valley landfill for Lori's remains. After 33 days of about 20 people searching over 4,000 tons of garbage, somehow, parts of Lori were found. Six hours later, the medical examiner confirmed the identity of Lori K. Suarez Hacking. Due to the conditions of the landfill, there was not enough information to determine Lori's cause of death. Her mom said that she weighed 115 pounds, but investigators recovered only 15 pounds. Mark Hacking was charged with first-degree murder on August 8, 2004, only three weeks after Lori's disappearance. Even after Lori's remains were found, Mark pleaded not guilty on October 29th. Lori's brother pleaded with him, save your family the grief and cost and plead guilty to murder. It was only when prosecutors dropped other charges against him that Mark finally pleaded guilty to first-degree murder on April 15, 2005. On June 6, 2005, Mark was sentenced six years to life in prison. Utah has minimum and maximum boundaries for sentences, and apparently everything in between is up to the Utah Board of Pardons. Lori's mother released a statement about the sentencing. The six-year minimum imposed by the law is an insult, not only to Lori and the baby, but to me and my family as well. I find it deplorable that a man could lure his wife into a fake world with him, where she's planning on a life based on pure fiction. Then, presumably, when she finds out that it's all a lie, he murders her and their child. And the minimum punishment set was six years? Thankfully, that nonsense was changed. The current standard of the time, according to the Utah Statewide Association of Prosecutors, was that most inmates had to wait between 18 and 35 years before a parole hearing. Still a problem. Most is not all. So, March 20, 2006, Lori's Law was signed into law. It would require that those convicted of first-degree murder serve a minimum of 15 years before parole consideration. June 6, 2005, Mark's father read a statement from Mark. I know prison is where I need to be. I will spend my time there doing all I can to right the many wrongs I have done, though I realize complete atonement is impossible in this life. I have a lot of healing and changing to do, but I hope that someday I can become the man Lori always thought I was. To the many people I have hurt, I am more sorry than you could ever know. Every day, my soul burns in torment when I think of what you must be going through. I wish I could take away your pain. I wish I could take back all the lies I have told and replace them with the truth. I wish I could put Lori back into your arms. My pain is deserved. Yours is not. From the bottom of my heart, I beg for your forgiveness. There is no such thing as a harmless lie, no matter how small it is. You may think a lie only hurts the liar, but this is far from the truth. If you are traveling a path of lies, please stop now and face the consequences. Whatever those consequences, they will be better than the pain you are causing yourself and others. What I get from that statement is a lot of I and my I have a lot of healing and changing to do. 
Every day my soul burns in torment. I wish I could take away your pain. My pain is deserved. His statement is full of, feel sorry for me, I'm hurting. The only sentence that starts with you is the most bizarre. You may think a lie only hurts the liar. What? Who thinks that? Liars are all about self-preservation. If it helps a liar, a liar will say it. I don't believe that Mark shot Lori. I think he used the bloody knife that was found. Hopefully she was asleep when the attack began, but I actually believe she was awake. Mark and Lori were seen around 9 p.m. at the convenience store, and Mark was seen again around 1 a.m., looking at the front and back of his hands. From what I could find, I saw nothing about a gun anywhere. No bullets, no neighbors heard anything, no gun found. Investigators found blood on his hunting knife, the headboard, bedding, and in Lori's car. But there was nothing about a gun. This is my theory. Mark was lying for many, many years. The more he lied, the more he needed to lie, and the easier it got. He became a puppet master, guiding those around him into the positions he needed them. People who knew him thought he was great, a little klutzy, fun to be around. He'd pushed the medical school lie all the way up to just days before a scheduled move. I have no idea what he would have done when the day came, but I imagine something similar would have happened to Lori. He may have been planning her demise, only in a different location. That night that Lori took her last breath, I think she mocked his character, or lack thereof, called him out for who he is, and realized in his presence that she's better than him. Conmen don't like the real them to be discovered. I think he attacked her with the hunting knife, and I think he at least attempted to disarticulate her body. He threw her in a dumpster. This is not the type of guy who would wait until his wife was sleeping and end her life with a single wound. I believe he said that so he could come out of it looking a little more humane. A humane killer. I have another reason why I think that the end of Lori's life was worse than Mark let on. I believe that someone who used lies as a core part of him would want to keep something to himself. The ultimate con. The final lie. Lastly, his name is Mark Hacking. He strikes me as the type to live up to the eponym. I know that that's low-hanging fruit to compare hacking with a knife. But I do think it fits, and they literally found a bloody knife. Plus, if you consider that most of Lori's remains were gone, where were they? His final story was that he put her in a dumpster. He said nothing about putting her in multiple dumpsters. But he lies. That's his thing. I read that there was mail and other items from their home in the vicinity of Lori's body. Where was the rest of her? I hate to say it, but I think hacking took his name literally. Then, to prove he was a changed man, full of love and light and repentance and humility, Mark was caught selling personal items, or murderabilia, like autographs and hand tracings, on a site called Murder Auction. And, to stick to his word from his statement, to become the man Lori always thought he was, Mark paid tribute to her with a prison tattoo of her. Well, sort of. He got a tattoo of a bulldozer on his chest, like the bulldozers used to search the landfill for the remains of his wife. Currently, Mark is incarcerated at the Central Utah Correctional Facility in Gunnison. <laughs>